Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sierra Lomonaco, and I am the Faculty Alumni Relations Officer for the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering. I'm also the program lead for the School Lunch and Learn series. After two and a half years of virtual events, it brings me tremendous, tremendous pleasure to welcome you all here today for our first hybrid event of the program year. Now, before we start today's event, I wish to acknowledge this land in which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Mississaugas, and the Seneca. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land. Now, I want to take this opportunity to thank Manual Life and TD Insurance for their continued sponsorship and support of the School Lunch and Learn program through U of T's Pillar Sponsorship Program. Now, for those of you who may be new to the School Lunch and Learn series, I don't know if you knew this, but we actually, this, this program series started in 1935. That was 87 years ago. So during that time, the class of 1987, they graduated, and as many of us knew, it was tough finding jobs. So like a lot of us did, we met, we hung out, and they actually met at Fran's restaurant, and well, the rest was history. So during the pandemic, the School Lunch and Learn series transitioned to a virtual event format. With this change, not only has the School Lunch and Learn series increased its registration and engagement, but the program reached a global audience. This year, the School Lunch and Learn series will offer two hybrid events and five virtual events. The upcoming virtual events will be hosted and held at noon, while the two hybrid events will be part of the new School Lunch and Learn series, After Dark. The After Dark series will be a hybrid event where we'll include special access to in-person live research demonstrations, as well as a chance to network, enjoy food and beverages. So a quick housekeeping item. At the end of today's presentation, you will have a chance to ask your questions. For individuals who are joining online, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. And for those who are joining us here today, you will have a chance to ask at the end. Please feel free to raise your hand. Now, without further ado, it brings me tremendous, tremendous joy to introduce the one and only, our wonderful MC and chair of the School Lunch and Learn program, Lori Hivala. Lori Hivala is a, not only an Electrical 65 graduate, but he is extremely dedicated and engaged member of our community and my partner in crime. So Lori, thank you so much. And everyone join me in welcoming Lori. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra, for that very kind introduction. And welcome to everybody to the first in-person lunch and learn since March of 2020. We, since then, we had to go virtual. And as, as Sierra mentioned, that this is a hybrid event, so it's both in-person and online as we speak. Uh, and the last uh, April of next year will also be an in-person and hybrid event as well. It is my pleasure today to welcome our guest speaker, uh, Professor Eric Diller, who will discuss and demonstrate how, the, how he created tiny machines controlled remotely using magnetic fields to help with medical advances in neurosurgery and diagnosis in the gut. Uh, Dr. Diller received his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in mechanical engineering at Chase Western Reserve University and his doctorate also in mechanical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University in 2013. His work is enabling a new approach to non-invasive medical procedures, microfactories, and scientific tools. He does this by shrinking the mechanical and electrical components of robots to centimeter, millimeter, and micrometer sizes. He uses magnetic fields and other smart material actuation methods to make mobile functional devices. He envisages a future where drug delivery and surgery can be done in a fast, painless, and focused way, and where new materials and devices can be manufactured using swarms of tiny, gripping, cutting, and sensing wireless robots. That makes you creepy, just thinking about that. Uh, Dr. Diller has received the MIE Early Career Teaching Award, 
the U of T Connaught New Researcher Award, the Ontario Early Researcher Award, and the I.W. Smith Award from the Canadian Society of Mechanical Engineers. And with that, please join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Dr. Eric Diller. Thanks, and thanks everyone for being here in person or online. Uh, it's a lot of fun interacting in person. Uh, the last few months we've been back in person in, in the classroom, which has been 100% uh, in person uh, instruction, which is really great to reconnect with students. And our lab has been working, uh, I mean, we were, we had, to, we, our work is experimental, so we had to do experimental work even as early as we could during, during the pandemic, uh, but only recently were, were we able to get back to you know, full in-person meetings individually with my students and my whole group. So this, is, um, this has been really great. So tonight I'm gonna tell you about the work that me and my students are doing to make these tiny tools. And we wanna make minimally invasive medical devices to go into the body. <clears throat> and I'm gonna tell you about two applied directions we're going. One is going into the brain so tiny snake-like robots. There's an illustration, and I'll get to the details of this one at the end of the talk today. And the other is going to be smart capsules, a, a pill that you could swallow to uh, go into your intestine and deliver drugs or take samples inside. So this is what I'm going to be telling you about. How do we do this? What are we able to do? And what are the challenges? So this is going to be uh, this is going to be tonight. So we haven't tested our clicker here. I'm not able to advance. I don't know if you can. Problem. <clears throat> Stand by. Oh, yeah, okay. I got lots of cool videos, so it's important to have the slides. So um, for, the, for this um, uh, brain surgery application, we've been motivated. I've been working with a neurosurgeon at SickKids, uh, James Drake, uh, who, who is a practicing neurosurgeon but also has a research lab developing new surgical tools. And we've been looking at a couple different procedures. Uh, one of them is removing tumors from deep inside the brain. Uh, and sadly, in children, this is the most common uh, form of, of cancer in children, uh, besides cancer of, of the blood. Um, and, and surgery is often a first treatment, especially in children, where recoveries can be remarkably, um, remarkably positive from even quite invasive uh, brain surgeries. Children's brains are very plastic, and they can recover from, from quite a lot of trauma. I'll show you some uh, graphic images of what um, some of these brain surgeries look like, where we want to go deep inside to these, uh, this pineal region is one we're, we're looking at in particular, uh, which is regions next to these fluid-filled cavities inside the brain. So I'll just show you some images here. Watch out for the squeamish here. We've got a clicker, clicker failure again. So on the top here is, uh, this is an adult patient, but this is a, um, a sketch of the skin where the cut is made to, to expose part of the skull, illustrating the extent of um, some of these procedures and how much access is needed. So they actually remove a large piece of your skull for some of these procedures. Um, and you see it, it covers a, a huge portion of the skull. Remove that, get access to the brain. Basically push some of the brain tissue aside and put a tube down into the brain so we can get access deep inside there. And so the bottom is a video, is what the surgeon would see through a microscope, peering down through this tube into the brain. So there's this long, thin channel going inside there, right? And so this is a, this is a pretty invasive procedure. Next slide. Um, and, and so lots of, I mean, people are, have been interested for, for, for forever since surgeries were begun on how we can do this in a less invasive way. How can we make this, instead of removing a large chunk of your skull, how can we make smaller tools that can go through smaller openings? And for a long time, people have, have done minimally invasive brain surgery by drilling a tiny hole and shoving, here's a, a very thin, long, slender tool, shoving that down 
a, a small tube into the brain, so a much less invasive procedure. And these can be done, um, and these can be effective, but compared to these open surgeries, where a lot more access is granted, uh, these have, have significantly worse outcomes. Uh, so they have, have more failure rates and have to revert to a more classic kind of procedure, uh, and they have more, more rate of complications. And the challenges here for the surgeon uh, is, is one of them, and a major one that, that I'm trying to address, is the dexterity of these tools. Right? These tools are on the long, thin rod, and the surgeon is operating them from way at the back. Imagine trying to have dexterity to pull tissue, cut it, and operate a bunch of other tools um, with, with this, these long, thin tools. So we want tools which, are, which have more dexterity. And, and a lot of you are probably aware there are very dexterous complex, sophisticated surgical tools that are used in other areas of the body with increasing, increasingly wide adoption. This is um, one of the Da Vinci surgical robots from Intuitive Surgical, and this is an example of fantastic, mechanically designed wrists. So these have a lot of the motion capabilities that you would expect from, your, from human wrists. So you can bend them with, with large uh, angles. The surgeon sits at a console and drives it with, with small joysticks. And here, uh, this is obviously just operating on a grape to illustrate. Uh, this is a video from, from a few years back, and these are increasing in prevalence for surgeries in the torso. Up till now, they've largely been used for um, gynecological and urologi urological procedures where there's more space available. These two tools are too big to go into the brain. So we want to make dexterous robotic surgical tools that are even smaller. And a lot of people have tried making these smaller and, and are working hard and spending a lot of money and effort in shrinking the mechanical device inside these wrists. And these are driven by cables, tendons. So there's cables and pulleys inside these that operate those mechanisms. And this is a nice approach, uh, but we want to think of a new approach which is going to be more scalable. So here's my son, uh, Eddie. Uh, this is about a year ago now. He's uh, fascinated and confused by what's going on. Of course, you probably know the trick I'm doing. I'm moving a magnet underneath the table and pulling around this magnet on the top wirelessly. And so this is a technique that I've been pursuing since, my, since I started my PhD. How can we do this, but in a sophisticated way, not just pulling around the magnet, but how can we use this wireless magnetic pulling to drive something like a surgical tool mechanism? So this is the grand question which I'm, a, I'm uh, trying to answer with my research program, how can we use magnetic fields to drive tiny tools? So I'm gonna talk about uh, the two applications. In the brain will be the final thing. We'll kind of circle back to that. More sophisticated, challenging environment. The first, uh, first application I'm gonna talk about is maybe a little bit easier going into the gut. It's easier because you can swallow the tool and it'll make its way through on its own. So we'd like to use magnetic fields Obviously, we can pull things around, but not just pulling them. We can, we can exert lots of different motions on tiny magnets. So we're going to put tiny magnets onto our tools, and I'm not going to talk about equations in this talk. Happy to talk to anyone afterwards if you like. But magnetic fields from a electromagnets like this, this is a tabletop coil system. At the back of the room afterwards, you'll see some of the experimental coil systems that we use for experiments that I'll show videos of in a little while. Coils like these can generate fields over a workspace. Centimeter size is really easy. Uh, 10 centimeters is not too bad. Generating fields over the whole human body is also possible. Think of an MRI machine. It generates enormous magnetic fields over the whole body. So if you spend a little bit of uh, money and engineering and effort, you can build very large coils that uh, exert fields over the whole body. Uh, magnetic fields work in most environments. So unless there's magnetic materials, iron, nickel, or cobalt, and their alloys in your body, your body is basically transparent to these low-frequency magnetic fields we're gonna use. We're not using like radio frequency, uh, which has some interaction with the body. And magnetic fields can apply not just pulling forces, but can also twist magnets, like a compass needle. So these two equations uh, uh, basically tell us that any magnet that we put inside the body will align with the applied field, like a compass needle, so we can twist things, apply those torques, and we can also apply forces. So we're gonna pull magnets around, and they basically get pulled towards regions of higher field strength. So these are the two inputs that we have, and the great thing is we can model all of this mathematically. We put a lot of effort in our lab, and a lot of our time is spent in how do we do this from a more fundamental level? How do we decide coil currents, those are the inputs to these electromagnets, that will create those twisting and pulling forces that we want? 
So I'll just tell you, we can do it and we can do it precisely. Us and other people in the community have, have figured out how to do this very nicely. So our approach to miniaturizing medical devices now is let's strip off all the robotic stuff of, of these tools. Let's put all uh, power, actuation, cables, all this stuff, let's take all this off and let's deliver everything wirelessly just using magnetic fields. So let's make our tools as simple as we can. And the simplest we can do, which is the devices I'm gonna show, are magnets connected by hinges. And that's gonna be our mechanisms. Okay, so before I get to the applications, I'll just show you the basics of magnets connected by hinges and what can we do with this. I'll show you one of our test uh, robots, which is a small multi-armed gripper, which illustrates the concept, and you'll understand what these mechanisms can do once you see this. So this is an animation that one of my uh, PhD students, Jia Chen, made. Uh, he's actually my first PhD student, and he's now a professor in Hong Kong uh, recently. So uh, this device can, this is just an illustration, but we want to be able to move it in three dimensions, pull it using the magnetic fields. We want to be able to open and close it and manipulate things like pick up little cargoes. So the way we do this, Magnets connected by hinges. So each arm has different bones, that's those rigid black sections which have the magnets in them. And each of those little magnets, each of those little bone segments has a different magnetization direction. And you may have be used to thinking about magnets as having a north and south pole. Uh, as an engineer or scientist approach, we think about it as a vector. So those red arrows are pointing from south to north pole. So you can visualize each of those magnets and they're each magnetized in a different direction. So this is like a side view cross section of this gripper. So those magnets are connected by flexible hinges. This gripper is made from uh, an elastomer, silicone polymer. It's like a, like a kitchen spatula and the end of it. It's that kind of springy rubber material. And they're connected by these, these hinges. So when we apply a magnetic field, imagine applying a vertical field to this bottom view here, each of those arm segments is gonna experience that compass needle twist and it's gonna pull, it's gonna twist those arms up. And um, actually we'll see later, this device is very weak, so this motion is maybe not relevant for this particular gripper. Depending on how much magnetic material we can embed in this, we'll determine how strong it can grip. But this thing's strong enough to, to bend up and grab some objects, which we'll see in a minute. Going into a little bit more detail for a second, we can actually use more elements of the magnetic field. So the magnetic field has a strength, that's gonna, uh, uh, we can dial up the strength of the magnetic field. It also has a direction, it's a vector field, it has a direction. The magnetic field, the third element is the shape. So how does the field shape over the space? And each of these elements of the magnetic field, which we can control using that coil system, each of these is gonna affect a different aspect of the gripper. So top left, the strength is gonna open and close that gripper. So we apply more field, it closes the gripper. The direction of that magnetic field is gonna orient the gripper. So it's like a big compass needle. We can orient it however we want. And finally, the shape of the magnetic field is gonna pull the gripper. So it's gonna pull it towards regions of higher field strength. So actually there's, if you count them up, there's five different inputs we can give. Opening and closing, orienting in multiple dimensions, and three-dimensional position control. And we can do all of these at the same time. And I'm skipping over the mathematics of how we can control all those elements of the magnetic field. Uh, so you'll have to take my word for that. We control coil current inputs to all those coils, and we mathematically model how it maps to this. So you'll have to take my word for now. Happy to chat afterwards if you want more details. So using a coil system like this one, this has six magnetic coils. We have other systems that have more or less number of magnetic coils. But well, we put, uh, this is just an experimental setup in our lab for doing controlled experiments. So it, it sits on the table and we put our experiments inside all of these coils. This one obviously wouldn't fit around the human body. I'll show you one of our clinical size coil systems at the end. We can watch our setup through cameras. Here we watch from the camera on top and side. We put a lens on there so we can zoom in. And we do some computer vision and we apply some, I'll call them standard uh, robotics techniques for tracking motion. Um, and doing some automated kinds of experiments. Here we have a gripper viewed from the top and side. So there's a gripper with four arms and there's a cargo which is a little piece of plastic. And this is an automated experiment. So the uh, computer vision is tracking the location of the gripper. It can levitate up and go and try and grab that cargo. So here we basically programmed a, a series of steps that this goes through. From a robotic standpoint, this is much more straightforward than 
than the state of the art, but just demonstrating what our gripper can do. We can move in three dimensions, we can orient, and we can open and close this thing. So this is a dexterous tool, right? It has all these inputs that we can give to it, and we can move it through all these motions. This thing is too weak. The amount of magnetic material, it's very thin sheets. Uh, it can't exert very large forces. Something like grabbing tissue and ripping it for taking a biopsy is what we originally wanted to do with these. It's just not strong enough to exert those forces. So what I'm gonna show you now is how we've adapted this magnet connected by hinges to two applications. We're gonna boost the amount of magnetic material. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about in the gut. I was approached a few years ago by a biologist uh, who works at SickKids uh, and who studies inflammatory bowel disease. Um, and inflammatory bowel disease affects a, a large portion of the population. Um, and actually has quite a high uh, uh, treatment cost. There's no cure for it, but people are, have their symptoms managed, basically. It's inf inflammation in the intestines. In recent years, there's been a huge increase in understanding that uh, inflammatory bowel disease may be caused, or at least is made worse, by imbalance of the bacteria and other microbes in your gut. And you've all heard recently, there's an explosion of interest in taking probiotics to treat your gut bacteria. So treat your illness, not by taking pharmaceutical drugs, but by feeding and managing the bacteria inside your gut. And this is an amazing opportunity in um, basically an alternative pharm to pharmaceutical medicine if we can manage our gut bacteria to manage our illnesses. It's not just inflammatory bowel disease, but a host of, of a huge number of other illnesses this is also uh, true for. So this would be an incredible treatment potential. The challenge is it's really hard to study how do you access and know what bacteria are in your small intestine? And it changes drastically along the length of your small intestine. We have drastically different uh, chemical and physical conditions as we go throughout your gastrointestinal tract. And so different microbial populations exist at different places. In humans, this is pretty much only studied using stool fecal samples. So that tells you about colon bacteria but tells you almost nothing about what's happening in other areas of the intestine. So different bacteria exist in different areas. We wanna be able to sample those, and we wanna be able to do it in healthy patients, right? Not just sick people, we wanna be able to do studies and, and understand what's going on with this. So uh, John Parkinson, now my collaborator, approached me with this problem. How can we, can you make me a gadget to take samples from anywhere in the intestines? I said, oh yeah, let's use our magnetic tools. So let's make a pill, you'd swallow it, it's gonna go on its own through the intestines. And here we're, we're targeting a simple tool. So we're not gonna, at least the first version of this, we're not gonna navigate it, we're not gonna drive it. We're just gonna let your intestinal uh, peristalsis motion pull the capsule through. At the right time, we'll activate it, trap door will open, take a sample, seal up tight. And then, uh, and then you excrete it out, collect it, send it to the lab for analysis. So this is a really, really low invasive kind of procedure for taking these samples. It's a pretty unique uh, capability, which there's no good way of doing this. And then by taking samples from different locations, we could build up a map of which bacteria are present and what concentrations where. Uh, my biolog biologist collaborator uh, applies data science techniques to analyze um, genetic sequencing results from, th from these samples and can, can determine what bacteria are present where. So these are the requirements for our capsule. There's a max size restriction. Uh, we're targeting 11 millimeters diameter as the max. It's a big pill, a big pill. You wouldn't want to swallow this daily, but uh, this is the biggest pill that they um, you know, give clinically uh, to patients. Um, so that's our restriction. Of course, the smaller we go, the more challenging everything gets. So we're pretty much gonna ride right up on that limit whenever we can. We want it to activate wirelessly. We want it to be robust, meaning when we activate it, for sure activates and takes a sample. We want, it to, um, we want to be able to activate it even if we don't know where it is. So later I'll talk a little bit about tracking and how we can tell where it is. Uh, but we'd like to be able to activate it even if it's just going on its own and we activate it. It should open no matter what. We want to make a, this tool as simple as possible. So the surgical application is that I'll show in the later half of the, of the talk here is maybe the more complex, sophisticated tool. This we're going on the other end. Let's make a simple tool that we can deploy um, not just uh, at premier hospitals in downtown Toronto, but something that we could deploy to any communities uh, with minimal, minimal expertise uh, on site needed, which we think will have a lot, a lot bigger impact. 
And of course, it needs to be biocompatible. The device needs to not fail, especially going through the stomach, which is a harsh environment, very, very acidic environment. So it's a big materials choice issue. Uh, we want to have conditions that don't affect the sample once it's been, once it's been collected. <clears throat> so this is our first version of our capsule. Uh, we're trying to actually commercialize uh, this capsule now. It's basically two magnets connected by a hinge. So it cracks open like an egg. And you can see here, our, uh, here we are just bringing a magnet close by. There you can see the clicking open and snapping closed. Actually, the biggest challenge of this device is keeping it sealed tightly because we want those samples to be from a, one specific location. We don't want a, a, a sample of average of your entire, entire intestinal tract. We want one location. So we want it to be sealed really tightly before and after taking that sample. So those two magnets, you see they're oriented kind of opposite each other, and they actually attract each other, which keeps the capsule closed really tightly when we're not activating it. And it also self-aligns when we apply that magnetic field. So wherever it is, we just apply the field, and we basically take a big magnet. This one, um, it depends on the distance, how close you can get. Uh, so this one, uh, we've fed this to live pigs, um, small size pigs, and we activated it with a magnet, uh, just like a hand size, palm size magnet. Basically, we wave it all around. Nothing, nothing robotic or fancy about it. We just apply the magnetic field everywhere just to make sure it gets activated. So that's the actual, oh yeah, here's the video of us with this live pig. Uh, we worked with some collaborators at uh, Guelph um, who were doing some veterinary studies and they had some pigs that they were already um, doing some uh, nutritional studies on these pigs. Uh, we, um, we don't want to you know, have animal trials that we're doing that harm the animals or we need to sacrifice animals. So we've been able to just, uh, basically when their uh, experiments are finished, we do a quick follow-on experiment with these. Uh, you'll see the, the magnet here is in this big box. Working with these pigs is really challenging because uh, they're pretty ornery. So um, they're, they're like pretty wild and don't want to just be held and have a magnet waved over them. Uh, and, and a big magnet can be dangerous if it gets near other metal, steel materials. So we put this big box so we could just hold on to it nice and secure while we're doing these, these first tests. We have a good idea of how the field dies off with distance from this magnet. So we know for the size of the torso of the animal or human, how big of an external magnet do we need? We can choose that uh, for, for that for the basically the animal that we're doing. So uh, our first trials, we fed nine capsules to two pigs, and um, eight of those nine capsules captured samples uh, from inside the live pig. They were actually um, the capsules were inside the pig's stomach, not the intestines, which is our ultimate goal. Uh, we have some big difficulties in doing real experiments in the field. It's a big difference going from the lab where we can just activate the capsule and everything seems great, all of a sudden going into the field, um, you know, where is the capsule inside the pig? They're difficult to observe. Um, if we feed more than one capsule, they'll stick together because they have magnets in them. So that's a challenge and we have future designs which are trying to overcome this as well. Uh, the, the pigs didn't want to eat the capsule, so um, <laughs> They, we would try to mix it in with their food and they would spit it out or chew it up and destroy it. Um, so our, our collaborators had, uh, had, some, had some challenge getting them, convincing them to eat these things without destroying them. Uh, but this is our first result. What's next? We'd like to track where the capsule is. Uh, after the talk here today, uh, there's some demos. Uh, two of my PhD students, Priscilla and Daniel, are at the back and they're gonna show you some of these capsules uh, Priscilla is working on the next generation of capsule. She's trying to make a capsule that will activate itself at the right spot, so she can tell you more about that. And Daniel's working on a method of how we can track them. So one way we're trying to track them is with medical imaging. X-rays, we can see them no problem. The magnets show up really brightly on X-ray because they're metal blocks. Uh, but we don't want to irradiate your body for, for, for trials for healthy patients, so that's not a great method. We might be able to use ultrasound GI tract is very difficult for ultrasound because any gas reflects the, the sound waves. So uh, jury's still out on whether we can use ultrasound, but we're trying to do that. I have a PhD student who's trying to use some machine learning techniques to, to interpret these difficult to, to view ultrasound images. Uh, we, all, we have all sorts of other capabilities and add-on features like multi-sampling capability that we're trying to, uh, trying to have. 
Uh, our goal is to, uh, to do some more proving of our devices through some dog studies, um, which we're working with the veterinary uh, college to do some, some more uh, dog studies. Uh, they're very confident that our device is safe. They're actually using uh, the staff's own pet dogs for some of these experiments. Um, we just feed it and then, and then they poop the capsule out. So, so it's quite a, a low invasive kind of procedure. Uh, and this is what we're trying and we hope to, to try something in humans when we can get enough uh, data to, to get some uh, ethics kind of regulatory approval for this. So this is, I would say, the non-robotic simple end of our devices going into the body. It's just magnet on a hinge, cracks open, we wave that magnet over. On the other end of the spectrum, let's get back to this first application I talked about, which is going into the brain. So this one, we need more dexterity, not just one little hinge opening. Uh, and so I'll tell you now more details about how we've, been, how we've been doing this. We're at a little bit earlier stage of the project. We're not, um, you know, we're not trying these out in real, real procedures yet, but we're getting close to there now, I think. This would be the concept. The surgeon will sit at a console, just like other robotic surgical procedures. And then we'll have magnets that go around the head. The head is actually a nice area of the body to do magnetics work in because it's, uh, it's, you can get magnets relatively closer um, rather than going over the torso where maybe you need magnets all over the length. So this is a good, a good attribute. We can apply larger fields the closer we put those coils. And then we're going to insert the, the, our tools through a very small tube. So you'll see our tools are very long and thin so they can fit through this tube deep into the brain. And this is our first version of our surgical tool. It's basically the same as everything I've shown you already. Magnets connected by hinges. So this version has three magnets. And it has three magnets that give it additional degrees of freedom, additional bending joints that we can, um, we can operate. So there's two fingers, and they open and close. So if we apply a field along the length of this thing, the, open, the fingers will open and close. If we apply a field perpendicular to the length of the tool, it'll bend the wrist. In the wrist, we can bend left, right, and we can bend it forward and backwards. And this one, it has these flexible uh, joints. They're actually thin metal wires, uh, which is very simple. There's no friction. There's no sliding components. Uh, it turns out this is a little bit too floppy. So we've, we've moved away from this design, uh, but it's a nice illustration. It vibrates if it's in air. Uh, and, um, and if you put a lot of force on it, those joints kind of kink up. They kind of collapse on themselves. Uh, so we've kind of transitioned from this design to designs that have pin joints, a little bit, a little bit simpler kind of design. But th so this, I would say, has three motions, opening, closing, moving up and down, moving left and right. And we can do all of those with that magnetic field. So we apply fields in different directions, and we can get those inputs going. So here's a video of the, of the motions. Now we're applying a field downward to bend the wrist down. And here it's just picking up a little plastic block. Uh, we apply a field backwards along the length, and it closes those gripper jaws. You can't really see the closing because it's just like a one millimeter of closing. And then we can, we can bend the wrist and, and drop that block somewhere else. Uh, afterwards, we have a version, our version two of our tools at the back, and we have a permanent magnet, and you can actually play with it and see the wrist and gripper opening and closing uh, with your own hands. Uh, so we've, we've been working basically in rubber brains, <laughs> fake brains in our lab. Uh, our, our surgeon collaborator um, basically is uh, part of their work is in designing training platforms for surgeons. So they have a lot of ideas about what should our fake brain look like and what should the material properties be to simulate real brain tissue. Here we're doing a simulated uh, tumor extraction. So pulling this, it's the green thing, it's actually a, a cooked pea <laughs> is our fake tumor, which apparently has similar uh, mechanical stiffness to, a, to a, a pineal region tumor in the brain. Uh, here we're just pulling it out um, as, a, as a first demonstration. This is our second version of the tools. As I mentioned before, they have pin joints. So it's a little bit more compact tool, which is nice. So the bending happens a little bit more tightly. And, um, and we're also exploring putting multiple tools next to each other, which is how, how, how uh, most surgical tasks need to be done. Maybe a suction tool or irrigation to provide uh, water on the site. Maybe one gripping tool and one cutting tool next to each other working together. So we're exploring this. Uh, we hope to be able to do two magnetic tools operating next to each other, something we're still working on. Uh, so regarding the size of them, just for comparison, here's some peanuts. So these are to scale. Uh, so the diameter is a few millimeters diameter, or they fit through a few millimeters diameter 
tube. So they're, they're really tiny. You can play with the one at the back. Uh, at the very beginning of the, uh, of the slides, I showed you a video of a robot operating on a grape. Uh, and that was the left, leftmost robot from Da Vinci, uh, the Da Vinci surgical system. So we're significantly smaller than those, uh, although we are competing with lots of people also trying to make smaller, smaller surgical tools. Everything I've shown you before involves these coil systems that sit on the table. These can't apply fields over the brain or other areas of the body. So how can we, how can we do this in the operating room? Uh, talking with our surgeon collaborator and other surgeons, uh, basically they want everything out of the way. So at first we design these systems that in, in basically encase the entire head in magnetic coils. And that is, that's the ideal setup for being able to generate fields in every direction and make uniform fields over the whole head, a nice engineered, easy to, to control system. And they kept saying, no, it's in the way. A right? surgeon wants to have access to the patient. Something goes wrong, they don't want stuff in the way. Can everything be completely under the table? So this is the system that uh, actually a master's student, Adam, designed and built this whole system. It has eight coils. They're big, they're heavy, and they all are underneath the table. So we get a little bit of trade-off, especially on uniformity of the field. So we actually have to pay a lot of attention to where we are on top of these coils to do our calculations correctly, which is a, which is a trade-off. But it's nice and unobtrusive. It's totally underneath, and it's easier to do experiments. Uh, here's me with the coils on the left there uh, in our lab. Uh, we're hatching plans of how we can take this over to sick kids in the operating room to do some, some trial surgeries, uh, maybe on, on cadavers, um, as part of their you know, routine trials that they do over there. Uh, it's too heavy just to like put on wheels and take over. We'll probably have to take it apart to take it over there. I'll just show you a quick video here of, uh, this is our version two of the tool. So this is, uh, has those tighter joints. I'll call it version 2.5. So here it is on top of that big coil system. So you can imagine the patient's head is there. So we've kind of put the tool at the right location of where the middle of the patient's head would be. And here you can see the tool bending with its wrist. And this is the, uh, very similar to this tool is the one that we have in the back. Uh, you can see the gripper jaws open and close and bend left and right inside there. So you can try this out on your own. Uh, it's difficult to know what field do you need to put in. So we're actually, I mean, our interface for the surgeon will be a joystick, move the tool left, move the tool right, and we'll calculate what magnetic field inputs need to be. When you operate in the back with Daniel, you'll have to do that yourself and play around with it a little bit. So what's next for our, our surgical tools? We want more force. So we've, uh, my, my student Cameron, PhD student who's finishing now, has done some, some extensive looking at uh, what magnitude of forces are needed to manipulate brain tissue during surgery. Uh, there's not a lot of information out there, but there are some studies uh, suggesting that our tools can apply just enough force for many neurosurgical tasks. Basically pulling tissue, so grabbing and pulling, which is called resecting, resecting tissue. Uh, cutting with scissors requires a lot more force. Scissors, actually what you're fighting against more than cutting the tissue uh, is friction in the joints. Um, for, for If you're cutting something soft like brain tissue, the friction in the joint is actually the significant portion of that. We're working on designing surgical scissors. But to generate much larger forces, we're, we have a couple different directions we're going on making transmission mechanisms. So this is an example, and I'm not gonna go into any detail, of a, uh, of a transmission mechanism that uses a, uh, a string that's stretched tight, and you twist one end of it. And as you twist it, it gets shorter and shorter as it kind of spirals up into a helix. And that pulling or shortening of that wire will activate the tool. Uh, it's really hard to make tiny transmissions. We can't just make tiny gears, or we can, but it's very tricky. Uh, we need like sub-millimeter size gears, very high precision, and these need to be reliable tools. So we're, that's why we're exploring some sort of alternative transmission kind of mechanisms. Uh, our existing tools get milli-newton level forces. This one's getting newton level forces with this transmission. This is definitely enough for neurosurgical tasks, even enough for surgery in other areas of the body. We're working on control and interface. What is the surgeon gonna operate with? How do they interface with the system? How can we do precision motions? So we need to have some feedback on the tool, which I have some students working on. Uh, and I mentioned before about having multiple tools working together. So this is an outstanding challenge that we're working on. Um, 
and, uh, and then we, we, we hope to demonstrate our tools with some real procedures in, in cadavers or, or, or in animals. All right, so this, this concludes what I'm gonna introduce today. For this portion of the talk, you can get more details from, from my students who are doing the real work. Uh, two of them are here, as I mentioned. Uh, just a few conclusions. It's really fun working on microbiotics. Uh, a lot of the, um, the ideas we're working on and these concepts of how we can use magnetic field to operate things at a distance, it feels like magic. Um, and it's, it's, really, it's, really a, it's really powerful to be able to apply mathematical techniques to be able to understand and then control those systems is, is really fascinating. And it's what has driven me to pursue this from a technical perspective. Connecting it with the medical side um, is, is, I guess, what, what really drives me and, and helps me form the vision for what our, our lab is, is pursuing. Other applications that I haven't talked about here uh, include delivering drugs into the body. Our capsule is easily adapted to drug delivery. We just load it with drugs in advance and it'll It'll release them, uh, so we are exploring that. Um, taking biopsies, so uh, samples of tissue from inside the intestines or other areas of the body is something uh, that we're thinking about and working on. We have a little bit of, of work also in non-medical applications like microfactories. Uh, I had a student developing a, um, uh, a levitating part, levitating microfactory, where we'd have sub-millimeter sized parts levitating and gluing together in this automated kind of microfactory using some of these magnetic and other, other techniques. Uh, I'm, of course, I'm often asked about how long till we get real implementation of these ideas. There's a huge span. So as I mentioned before, the, uh, the sampling capsule, we're doing tests, it, it works, right? We can, we're deploying it in animals and it works. So in terms of like proving the basics and knowing that it works, like we're there now, uh, road to commercialization and something that you would, you would have in a clinic and be prescribed a take-home test with a uh, capsule and a magnet that you would do at home. Um, you know, that's subject to uh, regulatory approvals. Uh, maybe in, in uh, Health Canada or US FDA would have to approve devices, uh, which would be the biggest, I think, hurdle to, to actually implementing. So we're trying to build that initial data so we can do some, some human, initial human trials uh, as the first step to that. That kind of thing is really hard to, to predict, uh, a few years at least for that. Something like those surgical tools, we're at a pretty early stage. We're showing, showing uh, concepts. We haven't done any real surgeries yet with those, um, but it's really unique. Uh, that's a highly novel kind of idea, these magnetic surgical tools, uh, and no one else in the world uh, is doing, doing this kind of surgical tools with magnetic fields uh, in the way we are. So this is pretty cool. Uh, so this is my current group, minus a few people, uh, Priscilla, isn't in this group. Um, a picture, we didn't take any photos of the whole group for three years. This is just the other day. <laughs> a, new, a new photo, I put some photos of, of a few of the students who've graduated who did the work uh, that I showed in this presentation. It's really great to work at U of T. Uh, you all know U of T has, has great students. and it's, it's really a pleasure to be able to brainstorm with my students, come up with some ideas together, uh, and they run with it. And they're the ones who are doing uh, 99 percent of the of the actual implementation of everything you've seen here and everything we plan to do uh, is done by them and I feel really fortunate uh, to be in a place that uh, smart excited people want to come and work with me to do this this kind of work uh, so this is everything I wanted to tell you today we're going to take questions for 15 minutes or so so uh, we'll do um, some online a few online questions first and then we'll do some some questions here so thanks actually my script said the opposite Oh. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Are there any burning questions from the audience here? Could you stand up, please, just sure. so we can yeah. hear you better? How much does that little capsule thing cost? Because I work in healthcare and we use those for endoscopy, but they're crazy expensive. Ah, uh, yeah. How much do the capsules cost? So the materials cost is very low. Uh, Priscilla, I asked this, Priscilla this uh, the other day. She said, like, oh, maybe we could make them for like, $2 for the, the materials that go into it. They're very simple. It's just polymers and magnets. Um, you know, what would, they, what would it cost as a product in a clinical environment? Um, that, that's very difficult to answer. It's, it also depends on what's the service being offered. Is it just a capsule or is it um, um, probably a, a business model for how this would be implemented would be um, 
not just the capsule, but also the results. So the sequencing, genetic sequencing and interpretation of the results. Um, so I can't really predict that. It's a good question that I don't have an answer for. More than a few dollars. Let's yeah. switch to the virtual question. Shannon. Yeah, so material in your body. Um, there are very few medical procedures done that use magnetic fields in this way. Um, so I don't have a 100% answer for this, but probably it would be the same restrictions as getting an MRI. So if you're MRI um, um, compatible, you're what's implanted in your body. Uh, if any of you have had an MRI, you know they, they give you a big quiz before of what's in your body. They make you remove any metal. But our magnetic fields are low frequency and they only interact with magnetic materials. So many implants uh, would be very low magnetic response or no magnetic response. So, so many implants would be, would be compatible with our techniques. It might actually exclude you in the end, um, depending on how it's used clinically. Yeah. It wouldn't be a major barrier for most people. Do I see any other hands in the audience? Yes. Yeah, your question is, what's the precision of motion, like in the wrists, the surgical tools? So usually we're limited on precision by how good our feedback is. So magnetic tools are different than these other kind of mechanically driven tools because we're, putting, we're inputting a force or a torque directly to the tool. So we can actually move it with really fine, basically, gradations. There's very little friction in the tool, so we can move it quite precisely. So it all comes down to how we can observe it and how we can control it to, I mean, if we want to drive it to a specific position, we need feedback on that. It's pretty difficult. It's hard to fit sensors on board. We're trying to use magnetic sensors. Uh, Daniel can show you what we're doing with magnetic tracking of capsules. And we're trying to do the same thing. There's magnets in the tool. And we're trying to use that, embed magnetic sensors on the wrist and sense the angles as feedback. Uh, we're also trying to use vision. So we'd have a camera watching, like an endoscopic camera. Um, right now in the lab, we can do a few degrees control very easily. Um, a clinical environment is really different because there's blood, smoke, uh, and a lot of other chaotic elements happening, which would erode that. So it's an outstanding question. I think we can do it great. I, I, think, I, mean, I think we can do it good enough for, for surgical application. It's an engineering challenge, and there's not fundamental barriers to doing it with whatever required precision. Yeah. Well, let's go back to the online questions. Yeah, so I have an interesting question here about um, any potential negative effects, specifically are there any mm. privacy concerns? So could someone else control the robots? Uh-huh. <laughs> a Star Trek fan. Um, <laughs> uh, Yeah, I mean, conceivably, an implanted device with some sophisticated uh, functionality, um, that could be a concern. Everything I've shown doesn't have embedded computation or microchips, so like our devices can't be hacked um, like a lot of other implantable devices, and I think that's a big advantage of these magnetically driven devices. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure we could dream up some scenarios of, of abuse. Um, I think these cases that I've shown here are very, you know, there's, there's no chance of that in these scenarios. Surgical tool, we just remove it afterwards. Sampling capsule, uh, 24 hours to 48 hours afterwards, it's gone. Yeah. Back to the audience. Any questions from any? Yes. What if you have a pacemaker? Is it, is it uh, in any way influenced by the magnetic? Yeah, pacemaker would not be strongly influenced, but I'm sure it would uh, invalidate you from having any, any magnetic field manipulation just to be completely safe. Let's go back to virtual. Yeah, I didn't talk about it at all in my talk. Um, what machine learning we're applying. Um, you all know that machine learning is being applied to every <laughs> domain of engineering and, and beyond. Um, in robotics, it's really taken over, especially in areas of uh, perception. How do we know where robots are and control? It's taken over from all sorts of classical techniques uh, 
uh, which uh, we were all taught up until uh, like now, basically. Um, in our work, most of the intelligence of the devices is embedded in their design, right? We're, we're applying magnetic field to drive things. People call this physical intelligence. So that's a lot of, of the level that we've been working on is on that design aspect. Um, but we are using machine learning, uh, for example, for tracking with ultrasound. There were some questions, um, or a big challenge for us is, is tracking. As I mentioned, ultrasound images are very difficult to look at and interpret. It requires a very skilled sonographer to interpret these images. If we want to have something automated that can, for example, uh, move an ultrasound probe and track the capsule and do activation at the right time, um, we're applying some, some machine learning techniques to do capsule detection on those ultrasound images. We're taking thousands of, and generating artificial, hundreds of thousands of images for, tri uh, for training some neural, uh, deep neural networks to, to do capsule detection. So that's one example. I'm sure we'll be using it more. Uh, Daniel can tell you about how he's using machine learning for tracking uh, using magnetic field sensors. Is there another question <clears throat> from the audience? If not, back to, sorry. Here's one. Yes. Uh, brain biopsies? Uh, we haven't been exploring that. So biopsies would require you to, uh, I mean, most biopsy instruments are basically like a cups, uh, some sort of slicing and uh, in, in other areas of the body. I'm not so familiar with in the brain. So basically you just need to cut the tissue and remove it. Our tools could certainly do that. It does require an amount of force. I think it's not the best application of our magnetic tools. Um, but other areas of the body, I think there could be, uh, could be biopsy uh, a good fit with our, our devices. Yeah. We, haven't, we haven't been working on that or, or collaborating with anyone on that. We have too many other good problems at the moment. Yeah, it's a good idea though. Can we go back to a virtual question? I saw one hand just go up a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, how difficult would it be to apply these techniques to two or more robots very close? So the question was about two robots close to each other. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> for example, two surgical tools. Uh, we're trying to do this. Theoretically, we can definitely do it. We've made demonstrations where we have a very simple robot with just eight fingers that do this, and we can actually drive each finger independently <clears throat> with all those elements of the magnetic field. For that surgical gripper, or the um, four-armed gripper I showed at the beginning, we can move it around with all sorts of different motions, five or six different inputs we can give independently. We can do the same for mechanisms. The more we have, the weaker they all get. So that's a big challenge and an outstanding challenge for us. I'm confident we can do some version of this. Our deal is going to be a scissors and a gripper so we can pull tissue and cut it. I think we can do it, but you'll have to come back in two or three years. We are working towards a closing at 7 p.m., so let me take this opportunity to thank all of you for the questions from our audience today, both in person and online. Before we close the virtual portion of the event, I would like to thank Professor Eric Diller for being with us today. Thank you for such an informative and entertaining presentation on tiny robots and the brain, in the brain and the gut. Please join me in thanking Professor Gill. Thank you. I, I heard some whooping. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to everyone who joined us today virtually, we invite you to share your feedback on the School Lunch and Learn series. A link to our online survey is being made available in the chat portion on your screen and will be shared with all of you after the event. A link to also to this presentation will also be shared with all registered guests, whether in person or virtual, early next week. Uh, just to bring you up to date, the School Lunch and Learn events are traditionally held on the second Wednesday of each month, as was today. Our next School Lunch and Learn event will feature Professor Margaret Chapman from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering on Wednesday, November 9th. It will be a virtual event only. I would also like to acknowledge again and thank TD Insurance as well as Manulife, sponsors of the School Lunch and Learn through the U of T's 
pillar sponsorship program. In closing, I would like to thank you all in person and online for joining us today for today's presentation. Hereby adjourn the virtual portion of the event. Thank you.